Ahoy hoy, I'm Planet Walk, and in the early 19th century, there was a bit of a problem with medicine. You see, homeopathy was getting quite popular. And the reason for this is because people reported feeling better after taking a homeopathic remedy, and they assumed that that was because of the homeopathic remedy. Of course, there were plenty of critics of homeopathy at the time, but they didn't really have any evidence on their side. The evidence appeared to be on homeopathies. Granted, the evidence was people felt better after taking a homeopathic remedy. We now know that that's not good evidence. Anyway, in 1835, a test was conducted to see whether homeopathic remedies were actually effective. This test was conducted on a homeopathic remedy, which was claimed to have 10 to 1 chances of making the person who took it feel extraordinary sensations. The test involved preparing a batch of homeopathic remedies and a batch of distilled water. Each of the vials were labelled with a random number and that random number was noted down as to whether it was homeopathic or just distilled water. Then people who didn't know which ones were the homeopathic remedies and which ones were just water started handing them out to people. Then three weeks later they asked each of the people who had received a vial if they had experienced anything unusual. Out of the 50 participants, eight of them reported back that they did, five of which who had had the homeopathic remedy, and three of which hadn't. From this, the people who conducted the test concluded that because the people who took the homeopathic remedy had had no effect, therefore the claims about homeopathy were wrong. That is the story of how the double-blind randomized control trial was invented, something that is nowadays considered the gold standard in medicine. It's become such a gold standard in fact that some people have taken to dismissing any medical studies which don't involve a randomized double-blind trial. This is often brought up when talking about large-scale studies which show that there is no link between vaccines and autism. Sure, the Danish study looked at, what was it, about half a million children to find whether there was a link between vaccines and autism and found absolutely none, but that's invalid because it wasn't a randomized double-blind trial. However, the things that I want to talk about today aren't so much about vaccines. It's more about instances in which randomized double-blind trials maybe shouldn't be done. This could be either because doing a double-blind randomized trial is useless or because doing one would result in negative consequences for the placebo group. So with that out of the way, let's talk about the CAS review. The CAS review claims to be an independent review of gender identity services for children and young people. And right on the first page we have a kid who has probably had some bad effects due to puberty blockers or hormones. I mean, just look at their fingers. Putting aside the disturbing AI images which are littered throughout the review, one of the things that the review constantly mentions is that there is no good evidence on trans healthcare. When the review started, the evidence base, particularly in relation to the use of puberty blockers and masculinizing feminizing hormones, had already shown to be weak. There was, and remains, a lot of misinformation easily accessible online, with opposing sides of the debate pointing to research to justify a position regardless of the quality of the studies. Now you might be able to tell where this is going. The report does go on to say, there are hardly any randomized control trials in children and young people receiving endocrine treatment for gender incongruence or dysphoria. Now there is a problem with those kinds of trials, one which the review comes very close to acknowledging, but doesn't quite seem to hit the mark. It is not always possible for people to be blind to a treatment. For example, in a treatment of acupuncture versus physiotherapy, patients will know which treatment they are receiving. And this is very important. If a treatment can be easily distinguished from a placebo, then you cannot do a double blind trial. It is impossible. Now this is something that should probably be told to the UK's National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, otherwise known as NICE. Now the most confusing thing about this institute is that it's N-I-C-E not N-I-H-C-E, which where did the H go, I want to know, but that's not the most important thing about this. The most important thing is that to help out the CAS review, NICE published an evidence review into gender affirming hormones for children and adolescents with gender dysphoria. Now this evidence review goes over quite a few studies and one of the things that it keeps pointing out is that a study is low quality due to a lack of blinding and no control group. Now this is very weird to me. It would make sense if we're talking about something like homeopathy for example, but if we're talking about HRT, 
you know if you're on HRT or not. You can't do a double blind trial of HRT because everybody who gets the placebo in that trial would know that they're getting a placebo. The whole point of HRT is to feminize the body and we know that it feminizes the body. We're not testing whether it feminizes the body, we're testing whether the effects of feminization have an impact on people's mental health. As much as double blind trials are useful, there is a time and place for them. You can't just use them everywhere. And this unfortunately is a big part of the debate around trans healthcare. Why are there no double blind trials on HRT for trans people? Until we get one of those, we're not going to treat trans people with HRT because we don't know whether it works. That argument is simply ridiculous. We're not dealing with something where we don't know whether it has an effect like homeopathy for example. We're dealing with something where we know that it has an effect and people can tell whether they get those effects or not. The same kind of thing can be applied to puberty blockers. I'm not going to talk too much about them here because I actually do want to make a separate video on puberty blockers so subscribe for that maybe? Anyway when it comes to puberty blockers it's not so much about whether they have an effect. It's about do those effects impact mental health? The whole idea behind puberty blockers is that puberty is a very difficult thing to reverse. For me, I still have a fairly deep voice. If someone is on a placebo instead of puberty blockers, they're eventually going to notice that their puberty is still progressing and that is going to cause distress. But that also brings up another point. Sure, maybe you can't do double blind trials, but maybe you could have a control group where you just say, hey, we're just not going to give you HRT or puberty blockers to see how your mental health fares. This brings us to the ethics and problems with denying people healthcare. So when it comes to healthcare that is seen as being effective, there are definitely some ethical concerns that you have to think about if you are going to deny people that healthcare for whatever reason. One of the big concerns might be, is the study that you are doing actually needed? Because if it's not, then you are essentially keeping people from healthcare when you don't need to do that. It might also be worth considering, can you do the study without keeping people from being able to access healthcare? A way that you could do this is by using some kind of other information to determine whether the healthcare being provided is actually helping the person. The way that a lot of new medication is tested today is by not comparing it to a placebo, but to medication that already works, just maybe not as effective as the medication that you are testing. Or maybe it works better, that's what you're testing for. Obviously that last one can't really be done with HRT because HRT is a bit of an all or nothing deal. I mentioned earlier that you're not testing whether HRT actually does something, you're testing whether the things that it does improve mental health. Now going back to the second point, can you do the study without restricting people's access to healthcare? HRT, people will say that you can't because they think that you need a control group. But there's a big problem with that. The problem is, is that you have to let people know that they're going to be a part of a study and what that study is going to involve. And the people who are a part of that study have to agree to be a part of that study or their parents have to agree for them to be a part of that study. If they say no, then you can't really restrict their healthcare. If they say yes, then there may be a few reasons why they're okay with being a part of that study. One of the reasons might be that they're not as worried about their gender dysphoria as someone who would refuse to participate. I've talked before on this channel about selection bias in studies. That would introduce selection bias. Now alternatively, you could take the UK's approach, which seems to be a result of the CAS report, saying, well, no one's allowed this healthcare unless they are a part of a study. However, that's denying people a healthcare which most studies show actually helps people. If you as a public official decided that we shouldn't give people chemotherapy unless they're part of a trial, despite all the evidence out there that shows that chemotherapy is effective, what do you think the fallout of that is going to be? The result of that is going to be people dying from not receiving healthcare, or they are going to get it by some other means. And if you find a way to get that healthcare through alternative means, it's not going to be monitored by doctors or nurses. Which in turn increases risk for people that want to get that healthcare. Something could always go wrong and I'd rather have a doctor monitoring the situation. So is there a way in which you can do a study on puberty blockers or HRT without denying people healthcare? As it turns out, yeah, you can. What you can do is you can check to see how many people stop taking HRT or puberty blockers and for what reason? If most people after let's say 10 years are still taking HRT, then it's probably doing something good for them. It's not a direct comparison of people who are taking HRT and aren't taking HRT, but telling someone that they can't take HRT for 10 years for the sake of a study, 
That's cruel. Especially considering that some people have worries about starting HRT later in life. We don't just all remain in stasis until we get access to it. No, our bodies get older. Sometimes we have receding hairlines that we have to deal with. And most importantly, I wouldn't want to wait till 30 in order to feel comfortable in my body. Having waited as long as I did, it almost feels like I missed out on a big portion of my life when I shouldn't have. These are all things that you have to consider. This is why you can't just test a medicine that might work against a placebo when there are medications that do work. And it's why you can't just demand that healthcare be restricted like let's say a vaccine because you think that there might be something wrong with it. There are ethical considerations that you must take into account in medicine and not just medicine but other sciences as well. I'm sure there are some scientists out there that would love to know the impacts of nuking the South Pole due to ethical considerations, I don't think we're going to be doing that. But most importantly, if you take nothing else away from this video, here's the thing that I really want people to remember. Just because something is very useful and has a good reason for being done in a particular way, doesn't mean that it's always useful and should always be done in that way. I had this exact argument against Flat Earthers five years ago where they didn't understand the scientific method that they were talking about and were claiming that it needed to be done in a particular way when it didn't. They didn't understand any of the reasoning behind the scientific method and used it primarily as a way to dismiss evidence that disagreed with them. People are now doing that, but for trans healthcare. They don't understand why randomized control trials are done in the way that they are, and instead are just using them as a way to dismiss studies that they disagree with. The difference between them and Flat Earthers is that they can actually have an impact on public policy. Don't be a flat earther. Between you and me, thank you for watching.